Um, if you guys want, you can put a, na a phone number or an e email if you want, and I can like email you the link. I'm gonna record this and throw it up on YouTube, so you can have that link if you give me some contacts to send it to you with. Just write something down there, and I can get a hold of you that way. I think I heard eight, so I count eight, so I think we're good. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm really flexible with time, so if you guys want to stay and chat later or whatever, that's cool too. They said we have the room the rest of the night. Um, my name's Todd. I'll get into a little bit more about me first. You guys know the restrooms are right out here. Feel free to come and go if you need to. Um, so yeah, pretty informal stuff. I do a lot of fishing and I love to share what I do with uh, everybody else. So that's uh, kind of what we're here to do today. So uh, yeah, we'll just jump in here. So a little bit more about me. I grew up in Southeast Washington and Tushy, Washington. Who knows where Tushy is? Okay, really tiny town. Um, I've moved up here. I lived in Emory Heights since 2003. Um, for me, I'm a rainbow trout, kokanee, once in a while some walleye, and then I fish salmon, Chinook salmon, sockeye salmon, so lots of fishing. I try to go, some weeks it's three, four times, some weeks it's, it's a couple weeks in between because I do travel for work. So this is just a hobby for me, just so you guys know I'm not in this professionally or anything like that, but um, definitely here to share some of my things. So let's get to know you guys just a little bit. How many of you have fished before? Okay, so we're not beginners. Perfect. Good. Okay, that's fine. Um, shore or boat? Both. So we can, we'll cover both. Good. Um, what are you guys mostly fishing for? Fish. What kind? <laughs> okay. Whatever's biting, right? Yeah. An eel pot. I'm not sure what that one is. You'll have to okay, that one I've heard, so. Um, I haven't done a lot of boat fishing. I can tell you a little bit about it. Um, Fort Spokane or Porcupine Bay is probably your best bets to go. Usually at night is what I hear. So, uh, and then who is interested in making their own lures? Okay, cool. That's a really cool thing I've started to do a lot of. I'm like the cheapest guy you'll ever meet. I hate paying more than I have to for something. And so even if that means I have to spend three times as long doing it myself, I'll do it myself. <laughs> so. That's a little bit about what's going to go on. So tonight, I mean, um, I have this presentation, and I don't know how far we'll get. I kind of broke it up in my head, but we'll see how far we go. I kind of started tonight kind of like shore fishing. Next week is more boat stuff. Um, but I have everything. So if we get through it all, and we can just add on the next week, we can add on. So we'll just see how it goes. Feel free to jump in, share stories, ask questions. OK? Um, I'm going to try to let you guys help lead some of this as we navigate through. Okay, so uh, there's the uh, overviews, everything I kind of had there. Um, I will try to cover as much as I can. I'll probably talk way too fast, but anything you want to know, feel free to ask. I'll try to do my best to explain it. So, All right, so let's start with the boring stuff, regulations. You guys all said you fished before, so I'm sure you're familiar with licenses. Any questions there on this stuff? Actually, what's the DNA current age that they have to have a license? 15, they have to have a juvenile license. I don't know why. For one year, they have to have a juvenile license. And then 16, it's an adult license. So. Which so is interesting because I took them to get their license at yes. 15, and they told me I didn't need one. I, I never trust the people at the counter. They tell me all kinds of stuff, and I'm just like, okay, I smile and nod, say, do this for me, and then I do what I want and walk away because. The big thing is, if you're not 15 without a juvenile license, you can't get a temporary endorsement. So you can't fish with two poles. Okay. Period. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, the, you guys all seen the fishing pamphlet? You ever seen that? There's a copy online here. Um, but there's also a paper copy you can get like Walmart or uh, I don't know who else has them offhand in town. Uh, usually if they sell licenses, they have the pamphlets. It's uh, the, so the fishing licenses just started over April 1st. So it goes from April 1st to March 31st. So if you buy one this week, you're good for like the whole next year. The pamphlet goes from July 1st to June 30th. I, 
can't figure that one out, never have been able to, but um, you can also um, find there's an app. A lot of people use an app, and I think one of the cool things about the app is wherever you are, it'll like tell you the rules for that lake, specifically based on your location. I've heard sometimes it's glitchy, so I just know where I'm going and look it up and go from there. No, I, the app is free, as far as I understand. It so, um, should be free. Um, I, th I don't offhand. We could look it up, but I think if you just go, I bet you if you typed in WDFW into the App Store or Google Play Store, you'll find it. Um, oh, Fish Washington. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely. So you said that. I was like, yes, that's what it is. Um, so one other thing I want to touch on here, it's not, not generally something we have to worry about um, locally if we're just fishing like trout and things like that, but when you start talking about salmon, I'm going to close this door. I don't have to hear the ping pong ball. Um, when we start talking like salmon and other things, there's what's called emergency rules, and that's just something where they don't know what it's going to be when they print that pamphlet. And so they come out with a statement that says, here's how you can go fish for salmon during this period at this part of the lake or wherever you're at. So a good example of that is um, Spring Run Chinook right now is open on the Columbia River until the first week of May, give or take. Don't quote me. Always look at the rules. Don't go off what your buddy says online or whatever. Always look at the rules and know them for yourself because it'll, that's what's going to count when you get talked to by a game warden is what the actual rule is, not what your buddy says. So, but like I said, spring fishing's open, and the only reason they open that is with a release on the website. And um, I think if you just go here, the, if you go on a W fishing game site, you can, you can kind of navigate through, but I always go to regulations. And then you can look by species, by where you're gonna be fishing. You can just see all the rules. So they'll post those as they come due. Um, sometimes they close things, so Sometimes you got to look there. I would say probably 90% of the time if you're fishing here locally, like Clear Lake or Badger Lake or Williams Lake or Liberty Lake, you, you just go with the pamphlet. It's going to be all right. But it's not a bad idea to check if uh, you're fishing somewhere else. So. And if you're on Facebook, you can follow the uh, game department there. They'll put out those things there as well. Um, I have anything else there I want to talk about? Okay. I guess the one other thing I want to touch on before you go is know if you're going on private property or not, right? So a lot of the lakes have a, at least a launch or a dock that's fish and game, and you can access that. And then past that, you're probably talking private property. So you just be careful there because you are on somebody else's land if you don't have permission kind of thing. Uh, if you get on a boat, you're pretty much good there, right? So. All right, so real basic stuff. It sounds like you guys have done some of this, so I might just kind of skim through. If you have a question, um, you can pop in there. So open face reel, it's going to be like this one. This is more what I use for bottom fishing if I'm fishing like just off the dock or from the shore. Okay, and then you have a spin casting one like that or similar to this. This one's more of a trolling one because it's got a line counter on it. Um, you'll see the bass casters, they don't have that, and then that's just where you're casting, retrieving, casting, retrieving. So it's really kind of what you prefer. I kind of grew up with this style rod, so this is kind of my go-to, even when I'm casting. Um, and then so you guys, I don't know, how much detail do you want me to go into as far as like the bail and stuff like that? Because everybody, I can show a video here in a second of the casting part, but... Um, I might just do that and let the video talk for me. Uh, most of them are switchable left and right handles. Yeah, for the most part. So like this one, you would take this off and you can switch that handle over on these ones. Um, this one is not, but you can buy them one way or the other. So you can buy them left-handed or right-handed usually. So that is a good question. That is something to pay attention to. Um, you can do it this way. It's just kind of goofy. Um, you know, if you're right-handed and you want to go that way, but it's, it's kind of goofy. And most of the poles are meant to bend a certain way, too. So, but you can see, let me just show you this real quick. So this pole is meant for the reel to be on top of the pole. 
that's your bait casters, like what's shown here. And then, you know, the, these, um, this is, there's another one called bait cast like that. Now these open face wheels are meant to go on the bottom. So you see how the difference is. The eyes are up on this one and down on this one. Okay. Is there something on the pole that will tell you? If you look carefully, sometimes you can see. I'm going to stick that through the ceiling like this one. This one really doesn't say. I will show you right now how I know. If you look at the eyes on these, this one's all really tiny. And then this one's bigger. Because when it comes off of here, that line goes around differently than this one. So when you go into the store, you'll see the little eyes and you'll see the big eyes. And they'll look like exactly the same pole. But one's meant for this type of reel and one's meant for this type of reel. And that difference is this. And a lot of times they call that spinning or casting. Okay. So this would be more of a spinning and this would be more of a casting. I can tell you on like the model numbers of these, usually it's um, SST-C for casting or SST-S for spinning. So that is a big rabbit hole as far as fishing poles go though. And I'm, I, told, I already told you guys I'm cheap. This is a $20 pole with a more expensive reel that I got as a gift. But you don't need an expensive pole. 30, 40 bucks will get you started. Um, I've caught three, four pound kokanee with this setup here. And this is a $40 rod and a $50 reel. So it's about $100, a little bit more. Um, but I was just at the outdoor show. They've got rods for $300, just the rod. I mean, it's crazy how much stuff can cost. Questions here? Yeah. Yep. So here's your here's your handle. This is the bail. This knob here is the drag. So what is the drag, right? That's how easy this line pulls out. Okay. So if I tighten that, this is a lot harder to pull. Okay. And so if you loosen it, then the fish can pull line a little easier for you. And so if you're dealing with lighter line, you typically want a looser drag. Looser drag is not a bad thing. It's always better to start a little loose and tighten. If you have too loose, you'll have problems. But it's better to be a little loose and have to tighten as you're reeling than have it too tight and the fish breaks off. So a bail is here that just flips over so you can cast. And I, I have a link here to a short video we'll watch. And then you just spin. This down here is the anti-reverse. So if I undo that, this will back off. If I keep it on, it won't go backwards. Um, this is how you take this off if you ever wanted to switch it out. Most poles have a little eye right here, and that's so you can take your bait or your hook and hook it in there. I tend to just do that for whatever reason, but you can go here. Anything else I'm missing? Okay. Yep. So then real quick on this one, it's a little bit different. Your drag setting is here on the star wheel. Okay. This would be your quote unquote bail. As I open that, this will free spool. Okay. And then as I reel, that closes. Um, I don't have a, I don't have an anti-reverse on this one. Um, I do have what's called a clicker. You hear that clicking noise now? So it's just an audible sound. So a lot of times what I'll do there is um, I'll leave the drag really, really loose. And then when the fish hits, I just hear it hitting. Um, I think there was one other thing I wanted to show on here. This knob here, what that does is as you loosen that, when you have your bail open, that controls how easy the line comes out. And that has to do a lot more with bait casting when you're doing this. The heavier the weight, the tighter you want it, the, the smaller the weight, the looser you want it, because it keeps it from going and unwinding on itself. And so that's kind of a trick. Um, we'll see what that video covers that I have coming up here on that. If you're trolling from a boat, most times it's not a problem. That's only if you're bait casting. So this is the guys that are standing there in a the boat and they're casting and casting and casting. Like seeing the Bassmasters kind of thing. Um, 
tackle box let's talk a little bit about tackle box i mean i'm kind of what do you guys want to know about this stuff you can go in the store and there's a gazillion things to buy right so <laughs> i've actually gone completely to this style stuff I, this this literally is my tackle box so um most of mine sits in the boat normally, so I just threw it in a bag to bring down here. But if I'm going with my dad, I'll throw it all in there, and then I just haul it over to the boat. Um, but I do a lot of stuff where I'm putting them on uh, rolls, so all your stuff's rolled up. Um, this is kind of a trick I'll teach you. This is a $7 mat, a sleeping mat from Walmart. It's like 8 feet long by about 2 feet wide, and I cut them into whatever size I want and make little slits in it and then I can use it to store all my lures on so there's a cheap cheap way they sell stuff like this that fits in the tackle box just perfect and it's all for like 10 bucks a piece of foam and I make 15 of them for 10 bucks so shopping list like I said you could go down the list you're going to need some weights hooks maybe some lures maybe some bobbers depending on what you're doing the basic setup, this is my go-to, right? If I'm telling you how to start out, there's two things that I'll do. The first one is just a slip weight to a hook. So you're going to need hooks. If your pole doesn't have line on it, you'll need a line for your pole, and then you'll need some leader. And so a leader is everything after your main connection to your main line on your pole. Okay? And so this is my go-to for trout fishing. It's just on the bottom and I'm floating a worm or a power bait or whatever off of here and I can I can show you some of the secrets there on that so that's sitting on the bottom and then this is floating up I can change the length of this by adding or taking away more line here and so maybe if I think the fish are a little higher in the water I can come up um, generally earlier in the year they're up higher and later in the year they're down lower now of course it just depends on where you're at, how deep it is, that kind of stuff. Sometimes you can get to the exact same place from the top or the bottom of the water column. Um, so the other way would be just a bobber. And so we would not have this weight here and we'd hook our bobber on here. And we'd have some weight down here to just kind of pull right under the bobber. They have what's called split shot and it opens and you just put a couple, there's a picture, kind of getting ahead a little bit here. Um, but then you fish off the bobber. When your bobber goes down, you set the hook, fish on. This one you're waiting for, and I think there's, I got some videos and stuff on here. You're waiting for an indication of a fish bite, and then you set the hook. So, we'll try to cover some of that. I mean, questions on tackle, um, I don't know. Like I said, there's so much you could do here. I try to just find something that kind of gave a good rundown of a good start. So. Like I said, at a minimum, hooks, weights, something to take the hooks out with, pliers. Where to buy? Not a, a full list here, but this is just some of my stores. Um, some of the stuff online there um, is a little bit more um, where you're buying pieces of the lures. So it's not just the lure, you're buying all the individual pieces. Let me show you an example of something there. Real quick, like. Other than the colors, what's the difference? About six bucks. And time. So this one you can buy in a store anywhere like eight, nine, ten bucks. And then this is one that I bought that was just plain silver from Hagensfish.com. You can buy just a blank Dodger. We'll get into what these are later. And then you can do whatever paint job you want on it. So you got to buy the paint. But the difference is this one's, a, this one's like a dollar to get started. And this one's 10 right out of the gate. So when you're starting out, you probably don't want to do that. But I'm just showing you where you can get to where you can really cut cost. So again, not a... Sportsman's, Warehouse, North 40, Walmart here in town, um, all good places to go to. White Elephant used to be great. They've closed. Um, there's a Gamble's Tackle Shop up north. 
Every now and then you find stuff in gas stations, sometimes the hidden gems. If you want to go to... I have a silly question. Go ahead. Does the colors matter to the fish? Do yeah. you need to color it? Um, they see colors differently depending on what they're feeding on. They might be more interested in a yellow versus a pink that day. Okay. So it, it there is... Does it matter for stock trout? Eh, probably less so. They're hungry, they're in the lake, they want to eat early on. As the numbers dwindle down later in the year, that's going to matter more. Okay. So, yes and no. I always, if I'm fishing like with somebody, I try to do something different and see what they bite on and then switch to that color. Okay. So here is some of um, what I was talking about, about rigging up. So here's the bobber that I was talking about, or a float, and then here's your split shot. So this is where you're, that was kind of where you're, here's the water level and you're only so far down. So this is kind of showing more like a river where you were maybe drifting along the river. But the same applies. Let's say you're at the dock at say like Williams Lake and you want to just throw a bobber out there and catch a fish that's swimming around say in five or ten feet. So you just put your bobber down that far and the advanced technique on bobbers is you can use what's called a bobber stop where you tie this little piece of string on and your bobber will slide up the line to where that string is. And that string is easy enough to reel into your line. So you can set your bobber down 15, 20 feet if you wanted. Probably no more than 10 really, but that's a it's kind of an advanced technique. Then this is if you were maybe drifting on a river like you were casting out and letting it kind of bounce and walk along the river as the current's going. They have what's called a, a slinky and it's kind of protected so it doesn't catch on stuff. And then this is where I was showing you your sliding sinker with your hook. So what I'm going to do is we're going to do some hands-on stuff for a minute. Good. Not usually, and I, I, I'll tell you my secret to that. I go to the store, well, I used to, you can still go to Walmart. I buy insulin needles, okay? And I look like a dry addict, but I'm not. And so you buy insulin, and you can just put a little bit of air in the worm, maybe three pumps, and that worm will float. And that's my secret for getting the worms off the bottom. I'm telling you, we're out there one day, nothing, 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 put a little air in the worms, float them off the bottom, bang. So they also have something called a worm blower, if you don't want to use... Um, an insulin needle. It's like a just a little white bottle with a needle on it. It's the same concept. But again, you're just putting a little air inside the worm to get them to float. So take one of these and pass those around. And cut yourself, I don't know, an arm's length of line. And while you guys are doing that, I'm going to spool up this YouTube video and we'll go over a couple. Thank you. I think I just added this new one. And I guess I didn't make it a link. Sec on this. I'm going to try to use the TV versus my computer speakers, maybe, maybe not. All right, now we'll just use computer speakers. I think it's a black box on the wall. Okay. I didn't run. I didn't run through that, so I don't know. I don't know what that's going to do. We'll see what happens here. So let me know, does everybody have uh, some line you're still working on? It? I just gave you, just take some line because I'm going to give you that and we can practice these three knots real quick. Um, now be more careful with these, but try to find two hooks that are close to the same size. So 
So we'll see if this is. We need two hooks. Yeah. Well, you can you can start with one. You can start with one. You can you can take two, but uh, we'll just we'll just go here. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Fish That Won't Quit. Okay, I'm gonna wait till everybody has their stuff. Yeah. I try to, um, I'll just, I'm going to throw a self plug in. I, I have a small YouTube channel where I've just been running a GoPro off the boat just to, for funsies. Anyway, it's DIY Fishing with Todd. If you want to go look there, there's some cool videos and stuff there. Um, but like knots and stuff, I leave that to the professionals. No, I'm just kidding. But, so when everybody's got string and stuff here, um, we'll play this so you guys can call on, follow along. So this is the cinch knot. So just showing you here, what it's going to do is it's going to cinch down on whatever you're tying it around, hooks, swivels, whatever. It's kind of one of the ones I started with. I'm kind of moving away from it in favor of another one, but I still use it, still use it here and there for different things. So, so everybody got some line? We're good? Okay, there we go. And we'll probably get Today we're going to go over how to tie an an improved clinch knot. Stay tuned. All right, so the improved clinch knot, one of my favorite knots. It's also one of the first fishing knots I've ever learned and I still use till this day because it's strong and it's easy to tie. So with your hook in one hand, your line in the other, place the tag end through the eye of the hook. Give yourselves about six inches here to work with of tag end. And what you're gonna do is wrap this tag end around your main line. I like to do about four to six wraps with the heavier line and six to 10 wraps with the lighter line. With this line, I'm going to do six wraps. So we'll go with one, two, three, four, five. Alternatively, you can spin your hook while you hold these, whatever is more comfortable for you. And six. And over here on the left end, you're going to have a. Okay, let me know when we're all there. Or you don't if you got, if you know how to do it and you're not worried about it, that's fine. But I just you guys ready for the next part? Close, close. Okay. Yep. A little loop that you created by making these. So right, right here. This tag end. We're gonna take back. that through that little loop. And through that loop. Just like so. Okay. And now when you do. So the, the original clinch knot, you would just pull tight at this point, but we're going to do an improved one. When, once you get through here, you take this and go through the big loop you just made. So it adds another little knot there. But I'll kind of let you guys catch up just a sec. Yep, I think he walks through it one more time, kind of full speed, but... Piece of cake. And I'll hit play. We'll watch it through here. If we got to back it up, we can back it up. That maneuver there, you create this loop here. And you're going to place that tag end up and through that loop here, just like so. And the next step is you'll want to keep tension up. One other secret with um, this kind of clear monofilament type line, it's not a bad idea to wet it, either lick it, dip it in water or something. When you pull that tight, it's going to rub together, and that can fray that line a little bit. And so it's always just a good idea to, before you pull tight. On this tag end, just like so, 
And on the right end of your main line, go ahead and start pulling the knot snug. You'll want to lubricate the knot at this moment. Ah, that's it. That will pre prevent any line burn. And just keep tension on the tag and keep pulling on that main. And this knot will come right down to the hook. And now give it a nice pull to fully set that knot. They make a nice little pair of scissors. La Paula has them. I saw them at Walmart, North 40. But what I end up doing is turning the scissors around so I have the blade in my hand and the little handles there and I put my hook in there and I use that to pull against. So I'm not pulling that hook through anything. Um, key ring. Put your hook in a key ring and then pull against it. So you're not trying to hold the hook and slipping. They make a lot of tools. Um, for tying hooks and stuff, but that's one of the big things I've learned is just to use some sort of ring to pull against. And then what you're left with is a tag end here. And then you can just off. you can just trim that down. And what you're left with is an improved clinch knot. Now I'm gonna go ahead and demonstrate with a lighter line. We'll go with the monofilament. So you see, if you guys want, we might try a different knot there. You can just cut that off if you All want right, later. Monofilament, we're going to do the same process. Place the tag end through the eye of the hook. Give yourselves about six to eight inches here to work with the tag end. We're going to do eight wraps since it's a little lighter of line. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now place the tag in the first loop you have in the eye of the hook, just like so. And then come through this new loop you just created. Now with your left hand, keep tension on the tag end while you pull the main line down. Just keep snugging that up while keeping tension on the tag. Is that close for you here? And just get it nice and cinched down. Great. Now you have that tag in to cut off. You have a completed, improved clinch knot there. Hope the video was helpful. If you have any questions, please leave a comment down below. And if you like. Okay. Anybody see that one again or we kind of get it? Good? Okay. So that's that's one knot I tie a lot of. Uh, where'd we go here? Uh, there it is. Okay. I don't really have these in order, I guess, here. So this is the other one I've been tying in place of that, I'll show you. Um, so normally, I'm doing these if I'm making like a little leader here. And um, it's right there is where I tied that clinch knot. Um, on my hooks, I use the double egg loop, which we'll get into in a second. Um, that other, that knot also I use right here from my main line to my swivel. So more so when I'm connecting parts of my line versus a hook for that clinch knot. Okay, so this is the other one um, I've learned more recently or perfected more recently and like a little bit better in this scenario. But sometimes I just tie this one by habit. So this is called a polymer knot. Sorry, I gotta get through the ads. how Google makes money. Okay. So you just fold it in half on itself, okay? This one's super easy. Okay, and then you tie a regular Granny Smith knot. Leave yourself quite a bit of line with the loop. You need a lot, a lot there. Okay. See how he's got about an inch or so there? Because it's going to go over whatever you're tying onto. Super easy, super strong. 
a lot less burning when you're tightening it down. That cinch knot has a tendency to burn your line a little bit more. So that's the one I've gone to from going from my main line to whatever swivel or whatever I'm doing. So just fold it in half, tie a knot, and then loop it over and pull it all tight. So questions there? You want to practice that one or it's pretty easy, right? Okay. So now those are the two I use, like I said, for mostly my main line stuff. Um, so now we'll talk about a couple uh, hook knots, knots to tie in your hooks. The, the first one we did does work on a hook too. There's no reason you can't use it there. But these, these are the two I would prefer to use on a Uh, it would, it would as well. Um, so really, all of them work anywhere. I'll just preface that way. I prefer to use those first two for connecting pieces of my line, and these next two for hooks. All right. So now let's learn my easy snell knot. I've been doing this um, for a couple of years now. Uh, I was trying to find a knot that was a lot easier to tie than the, the smell knots out there, which were pretty difficult, to be honest with you. And uh, I ended up coming up with a way to tie the uni knot to the shank of a straight shank hook. And uh, this is a knot that I use with heavy braid line when I'm fishing uh, real heavy cover, punching mats, um, you know, usually when I'm, I'm flipping with a straight shank flipping hook. So uh, it's really easy. You simply pass it through the eye of the hook, make sure it's through the top of the eye of the hook, and then go ahead and make a loop, give yourself plenty to work with. And then starting at the eye, going down the, the shank of the hook, you're going to go ahead and wrap that around the shank and the, and the line going through the loop. And we're going to do this you know, with real fishing line. You're going to want to do it six or seven times, as many times as you can before you reach that little uh, bait keeper that's usually on these hooks. We're going to do this four times. One, two. Heavier line, the less loops you can do. You can get over five with real heavy line. I like to keep my thumb on the, on the knot. That way it folds up nicely. And then I pull that back. Pull it tight. And just go ahead and pull that tight right there. If you do it wrong, cut the line. Line's super cheap, right? Cut it, retie it. You don't want to have it kind of goofy, have it break off or something. So as you're tying stuff up, if you don't get it this quiet, that's fine. Take your time. Do it again. You want to see it again? Yeah. Sorry, I thought you said say that again. So I, I just want to make sure. Yep. So this is like this is kind of, kind of the basis to the start of the next knot. So this will be good. So now let's learn my easy snell knot. I've been doing this um, for a couple of years now. Uh, I, I was trying to find a knot that was a lot easier to tie than the, the snell knots out there, which were pretty difficult to be honest with you. And uh, I ended up coming up with a way to tie the uni knot to the shank of a straight shank hook. And uh, this is a knot that I use with heavy braided line when I'm fishing uh, real heavy cover, punching mats, um, you know, usually when I'm, I'm flipping with a straight shank for the hook. So uh, it's really easy. You simply pass it through the eye of the hook, make sure it's through the top of the eye of the hook, and then go ahead and make a loop, give yourself plenty to work with. And then starting at the eye, going down the, the shank of the hook, you're going to go ahead and wrap that around the shank and the... And when I tie this knot, actually, I, I rest this loop right on my hook to keep it from twisting on me. It's just a different way of tying the same knot. But. Yep. No, it's fine. Thanks. Like right there? Yep. Goes through the knot, or through the little pole. Okay. And then you make a loop, and then you just wrap it around that loop. So basically what you're doing is you're putting your wraps right here, and then this is going to pull all those wraps down. So I'm making the loop down here, not through this, and then I'm wrapping 
Uh huh. Is that correct? Yep. So I have it yep. Just make a loop there. Yep. And then um, I think I think you want to use this piece to wrap on. Because so. just turn that like that and then wrap it, kind of. I think it's hard to see what's under your. So yeah. So you want to wrap over that piece. Over this piece. Yes. With that smaller. Like this. Yep. And then go through your through the loop, yeah. and through there. This loop. Okay. Here, let me show you this right here. So you see how he's going inside that loop. Every time. Every time. I'll just uh, I'll just start this over and we can just kind of watch it on repeat a couple times here. And honestly, if you just if you just go on YouTube and you type in snail knot, there'll be a thousand videos. Find the one that you understand best. There's a weight room on top of us. I've been trying to figure out what the heck it was. And then starting at the eye, going down the, the shank of the hook, you're going to go ahead and wrap that around the shank and the, and the line going through the loop. And we're going to do this with real fishing line. You're going to want to do it six or seven times, as many times as you can before you reach that little uh, bait keeper that's usually on these hooks. We're going to do this four times. One, two, three, four. Then you go ahead and hold that. I like to keep my thumb on the, on the knot. That way it folds up nicely and then I pull that back. And that's really snug and that's going to create that popping motion the hook, it's going to pop that hook point right into the fish. So, so one way I like to think about it is if I have my hook here and I put my line through there, I just follow that hook, okay? And then I grab it with this, probably I go the other way, and then I grab it. So I've got my, I've got my loop following that hook, which is kind of opposite how he shows it. But if I just follow that hook and then come up, let me grab some line. He's got the line back here. Yeah. If I just follow that hook and then come up here with my tag, and then I just wrap around that shank, and then I pull that through. So that's kind of how I visually do it. It's good stuff. It's still stuck on there. How are we doing over here? You guys learning knots? Okay, you might be doing like an egg in the loop, yeah. which is the next one. Okay, so. Can I, will you look behind me and watch me do it? Yep. Okay, so, so hold your hook, hole. try your hook this way. Are you right or left handed? I'm right handed. Okay, try holding your hook that way for just a second. Okay, now where's the free end? This is your short end? This is my short end. So take your short end through like this for just a second. Okay. Okay. We're going to try this just a little different. See how I have it like that? So I'm it up. So you see how the loop follows the hook now? So bring yourself, bring yourself another three inches on this line. There you go. Now, just follow your hook to make your loop. And now put that loop in your in your fingers. Hold it. Perfect. Like this. Yes. Now loop around the shank of the hook. Like going through the go no go through the hole that you just made. Yes. Like that. So, so just through that hole you're making. Okay. And then through the hole again. And through the hole and through the hole. And as you're wrapping those, you want them to be nice and on top of each other. So pull it down, pull it down tight on that shank. So they they're always that's there. Yeah. So it's always wrapping around that hook. So now it's all off of the hook. 
Yeah, it's hang on. So, <laughs> okay, so like as you tie that, you want it to just keep going around that hook in progressive manner and not on, on top of itself. So. Oh, I see. So as you just keep going around there. Yeah. Okay, now, as I look back when I'm all done, see how it, 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 it's going to pull yeah. on itself. Okay. Well, I'll look down the other way, sorry. But it, it takes some practice, right? I mean, let's try this other one real quick, too. This one's a little bit more complicated, but by far and away is my favorite knot. And I'll tell you what I do. When I just want to Netflix and chill, I tie leaders. And all I do is sit around and tie hooks. So I go buy myself a package of 25 hooks and some leader line, and I just tie hooks. And then I put them all on here. So when I'm out on the water, I don't have to mess with all this with the boats going on. I just pull a new set off. Well, then how do you attach it to your line? Yep. So we'll get there. We'll get there in the lure building part. So with the two hooks like that, then I put whatever I'm going to fish in front of the hooks on there, and then I tie another knot, and then it hooks in. So the, this is called leader, leaders because it kind of, it's everything after your swivel. Okay. So as an example, this started as just two hooks at one point in my life. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then I added all this stuff to it and poked myself with the hook. And then some way to attach it to the line, either a swivel because this one spins a lot, or I just do like the palm almost, you just make a loop and tie a knot. I think they call that the surgeon's knot. So that's how you get it to your line after the fact. Okay, so while we're looking at it, the types of hooks you guys have there are called octopus hooks. There's thousands of different kinds of hooks for trolling from a boat. Um, I generally like the octopus, but I've gone to one called a split shot drop shot by Gamakatsu, and it's been kind of my favorite one. I can show you some of those later. Okay, so let's try this double egg loop maybe. Uh, PowerPoint. So this one's a little bit more versatile knot. It's a lot stronger knot. Um, the what we just tied will work for trout. It'll be fine. This is This is the loop I tie on all my salmon gear, the egg loop knot. The other reason is, is if I ever want to put some bait or something in there, it actually has a built-in loop mechanism with it where you can pull a little line back and like hook it over your eggs and pull that through. So let's get into this one. I don't think there's much volume on this one. Uh, it seems to be a quick overview, I think, unless I'm halfway through it now. Okay, so. You don't need, you don't need much there, just enough to get past the end of the hook. And then you're going to do your five or six up to eight loops, okay? And this, this is kind of practice for the other knot, too. It's a little easier to do it this way because you don't have that other thing in your way. Now you pause right here. Okay? If you, this would just come undone if you let go of that. Okay? So you got, it takes a lot of strength to hold that knot and the hook with this hand. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we're going to loop through and we're going to kind of do the snail knot now. And that's how we do it. So I'd go home and just practice this. So 
So you got, and I always start with a longer piece than I need because you can always shorten it after you're done. Okay, so he puts it back through, not very far. Maybe, maybe like an inch back through this way. And then he pulls all that extra string back this way. Did I leave that hook over there? Yeah. And line. No, I don't want to steal your line. No. Might have set it over here somewhere. That's okay. We'll watch this. We'll watch this. I found it. Nah, <laughs> that metric. So now he's wrapping over that line, the bulk of the line again. So again, this is a little bit more complicated one. And you got to hold all that tight while you pull that through on itself. And you see it's twisted there. You'll want to kind of untwist that as you tie it if you can. And now what you'll see here is it's created this little loop right there that you can actually push back through to use to capture some bait. I think he shows that here in a sec. Right there. So that little loop, then you can wrap around whatever bait you have on. Totally lost on that one? Yeah, I missed one step. So okay. So he held, he held a loop after he went through, right? <laughs> Let's see. So right here, all he's done is... So let's go back to the beginning. Back to the beginning, okay. Okay. So you just start right here. Through the eye of the hook, can't see tonight, and you just need enough to get you down the shank of the hook, or so, whatever, and then you're going to take this longer piece and wrap five times, four or five, and then you're going to try to hold that with your fingers for a sec, take this, and go back through the through the hook through it. Over the top or under up? Um, up and down. Okay. And then once you do that, you just need an inch. You just need about an inch. Okay. And then all this stuff has to go back here, so that I just have that inch sticking through, and all that is back here now. And I have this piece. So this is the one that's going through the hook, and this is the one we did our loops with to start with, okay? So this is the one we were looping with, and this is the one I just put through the hook. And then I'm going to take that and then start looping again. And every time I do that... Oh, you put the short piece through the hook, not the yes. long piece. Oh, that's well, I'm it is the long piece, but you just put a little bit through. And then so once you get your five wraps, you just pull this tight and it pulls it all down on itself and then you've got your piece so we'll watch it here on the big screen let me make it let me make it big here. so that's your short piece to start right there now you stop now you've got the long piece that you're going to wrap six times hey the camera's right there I just grabbed a cup from my dad and filled up right there. Don't. Okay, don't. Okay. Can I have a cup? Get a line. No, I'm not doing it. Just cut it off. The scissors are back there. Where the string is? They're right there. Just cut it off. This one does take a little bit to get used to, so you might have to just go home and practice this one a little bit more. But it is, it is a really strong knot, and a lot of your factory stuff comes this way if you just buy a lure out of the box. So now you said that I used the long and the short one, so it's kind of confusing because if I started with the short one, and then there's the short one now. So the short one is, it's only an inch sticking out here. So, yep.
So the, the first, the longest piece is right here, and he's got all this string over here that he looped through there. Okay? So this, this is the longest, this goes to the long end, and it's all laying over here, back up through there. That's where I'm not getting it. Yeah. It's okay. okay. So you got I your first. It, I wrapped it all around. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. okay, so now take this end right here and yeah. stick about an inch of it through there. Up nope, top. down through the bottom. Down yep. through the bottom. Now, okay. with your right hand, pinch it right where that went through. Uh, like, pinch it like right there. What do you mean by pinch? Replace, replace your, because you want this to go here, so you got to get that hand out of the way. So, so place, switch your hands. There you go. Now, see this lays here like this. Oh. And I take this piece that I have here and continue my wrapping. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just took a minute to see it. Yeah. Keep going or back up? Keep going. Yep. So, like you said, once you make that big loop, now he's just going to continue that wrap with this line on top of the hook shank. So this is the loop he just made, and he's still got a whole bunch of line there, and he's going to keep wrapping on top of that now. And so all the extra line is right here right now that he's pulling out with that inch piece you have sticking out there. And then you can clip that piece off right there. If you guys have your stuff on here, I can email you these YouTube links too, or, or text or whatever you put down on that paper, if you need them. Great. I don't know what's making noise, but we don't need noise anymore. Um, okay. I guess I do have two more videos here on casting real quick. Oh, I clicked the wrong button. Okay, so we'll watch these real quick. to cast a spinning rod. This is a spinning rail, this is a spinning rod. Uh, the reel fits on the bottom, this is what it looks like. Uh, they've got another video that talks about parts and pieces. Anyway, it's a great reel to start with. It's what I recommend for all beginners. Not those little push buttons that sit on the top of the rod. Those are okay for little kids because that's about all that's available in Spider-Man and Barbie. But um, <laughs> advance them to a spinning rod as soon as you can, as soon as possible. Um, and if you're a little bit older, uh, grab one of these. This is this is a great starting reel. I don't like those push buttons because they're very problematic and they tend to be real frustrating. And I bet you a lot of people have stopped fishing because those things have stopped working on them and they don't know what to do. So here's your spinning reel. When I tell when I'm teaching clients how to how to cast a spinning rod, I uh, I tell them it's like throwing a baseball except you're releasing with one finger. So you're throwing a baseball and there's a point in time when you're throwing that baseball where you release it. Same thing with your finger. There's a point in time where you release it with your finger. All right? Now, first of all, here's the bail. I've got another video that talks about parts and pieces of a spinning rod. Um, you take and you grab the line. First thing you do is you, you make sure that bail is turned where this, um, where the line is closest to your finger. So if it's down here like that, just give it a little rotation. Okay? Grab it with your finger just like that. Make sure, let me hold this way back here. Make sure that your, you've got 12 or 18 inches of line coming off the end of your rod with your, with your bait on it. Um, I typically reel right to the weight when I've got a weight on there. He's fishing with just a lure. But um, make sure, like I said, there's 12 or 18 inches on there. 
grab your line just like this, open your bail, okay, and like I said, it's just like throwing a baseball, um, and you can, you can whip this rod pretty good. I do it two-handed or one-handed, and it's just real slow motion, it's, and you let it go, just like that, okay? I'm going to do that a couple more times, just like throwing a baseball, bring it back. We used to call it spring training. We would just tie the weight and go out to the park and take the hook off and just practice three times to get used to it again every spring. Just watch out for cars. And it'll go a long ways. And that's a spinning rod. Um, it does have its problems. It has uh, problems with, uh, with, line cat, uh, with line twist. And some of the ways that you can uh, reduce the line twist, you'll never get rid of it because it's a spinning rod and that's what happens. Um, but anyway, you reduce, you can reduce it by one, uh, when you make, after you make a cast, hand flip that bail. Don't do it like this. I know it works, but don't do that. You make your cast, hand flip your bail. Pull your line tight where it comes all the way around to the, uh, to the guide, to the line guide. Okay? And then start reeling. Now when you're fighting a fish, and you hear that drag pulling, don't reel. Okay? That will, I mean, that causes more line twist than anything else. Don't really into your drag. I know sometimes you can't help it, but I see all kinds of beginners. What he's talking about there is, is if you spin this when your line's not coming in, you're twisting your line up. And then so when you undo your bail, it's going to because it's all twisted up. Think of like a rubber band. You twist that rubber band, you let go, it goes, boom, right? Same thing here. That's what he's talking about, that line twist. More, more so on those than on these. There's every day the fish is pulling the drags and winding and they're just steady cranking and that line is not, I mean, that, that bait's not going anywhere because it's good they've got a big fish on. So when you hear that, that noise, don't reel. And then when, when the fish is turned, I mean, fight the fish, but when the fish turns to you, start reeling again. Um, it's kind of tricky. It's something you really have to teach yourself. But uh, try not to reel into that drag, and you won't get that much line twist. Well, like I always say, visit BassResource.com for the answer. So does that make sense? If that fish is really pulling hard, most of the time you don't want to be able to be reeling anyway because you can pull the hooks out too. So let the fish fight. That's what the pull's for. That bend in the pull. We'll let that fish fight. You want to maybe just real slow, but don't be getting after it. We'll talk a little bit about tactics here. But if the fish is coming to you, keep reeling. Don't stop reeling. You always want to be reeling. But if you feel him pulling, just relax a second. And in the heat of the moment, you'll reel as fast as you want anyway. But we'll try to show you what to do. Okay, so I think the next one is on the other type of rod real quick. I'm a, I'm a big YouTube guy. I almost watch more YouTube than regular TV. There's so Please much information so out there. Long. Isn't that right, Kennedy? YouTube's on all the time, huh? Hey guys, this is Gene Jensen with BassResource.com. So this is the bait caster that I was talking about. I don't, I don't have one uh, on me, but. Uh, like, I just want to put one on my channel. Uh, just to have it on there. But uh, what I've got here is I've got a uh, an Abu Garcia uh, Black Max combo. Um, I've got you know a lot of subscribers who are just getting into bass fishing, so I decided to go out and and uh, and pick out three or four or five. Uh, Entry level rods, and this is one of the rods I picked out. I'm just kind of trying out the reel. It's been a pretty good reel so far. The rod on the combo is uh, not that good, but I, all you can afford is $70 or a, I guess there's 60 or $70. Yeah, okay. Then I uh, think I would recommend this. So, one of the problems with this one, like I was saying with that little adjustment, is when you cast, sometimes they can keep spinning. That's called backlash, and it, he'll talk through some of that, but I just wanted to kind of touch on that. You can adjust that with that silver knob. Um, I think the rule of thumb is to open your open your spool so it will fall down and adjust it so it just barely falls, I think is the rule of thumb. It's real, pick up the rod. He might even go over that. I, it's been a while since I put this video on there. But anyway, um, I cast a bait, I 
bait caster. Okay, first of all, let's talk about how to set one up. You put a new lure on your bait caster to take the prey off. Turn it all the way off. Okay. And tighten that knob down right there. Alright. That's your spool tension knob. Okay. Hit your button and you gotta loosen that knob until your bait just starts to fall. Take the turn that break all the way about halfway up. That's how you get started. Alright? Okay. Now how to cast it. Here's your here's your button. You push your button down and you hold the line with your thumb. If you don't hold the line with your thumb, it's gonna go out. Right. Okay. Hold the line with your thumb. And then it's a smooth back cast and smooth front cast. You don't want to whip it like you would spin the line. You just it's just a smooth cast. So I like to start off with side arm. Um, and when I teach it people, I also have them start on the side arm. It's just easier. We have less of a tendency to, to, to whip it like you would in a spin anymore. So um, I'd recommend you go out in the yard and practice this using, uh, using a practice plug or, or a, a weight on the end or a jig rod or like something to say. Something you're not going to work with. Um, anyway, nice smooth back cast, nice smooth front cast. And so I just. One of the harder rods to cast, right? That's why I kind of stick with this one. But there is a time and a place for that if you're out fishing for bass or something. Yeah, it works for trout too. And Feathering it from the time I let it go to the time it hits the water, just like that. All right, like I said, take it out in the yard, practice it. Uh, give yourself plenty of room. Find a, if you don't have a big yard, go out and find a field or something like that. Practice it for several hours. You'll find yourself getting better and better at it. Figure out what your release point is um, with your thumb. And, uh, and, and uh, be patient because it's going to take you a little while to figure it out. You're going to get some backlashes. Um, but if you remember just to barely release enough of your thumb to let it go and to feather it um, and train your thumb to do that, that's all it takes. And like I always say, visit bassresource.com for the Okay. Do you, do you use a bait caster at all? No. I, yeah. while, I, while I fish in, but I'm not casting it. Right. It's so. uh, like where you have his thumb that starts to backlash on you. Thumb will pick that up and it will push his thumb forward to slow the spool down. Otherwise, it will backlash and mm-hmm. you'll regret ever having Yeah, and you yeah, got an hour on doing it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Easier sometimes, yeah. Okay. So, like, the one time I use that is walleye fishing, which is more of a boat technique for me. But you just push that, and then it lets your line go out deeper, and you retrieve it to bring it up, because walleye, you're tracking the bottom as you're trolling. Um, that's how I walleye fish. Okay, so let's see here. It's a little after 7. I wanted to talk a little bit more about a few things. I had three more slides. So this is kind of more open discussion, but... I wish I could tell you where to go fishing every time. It's going to depend on the lake, but some things to talk about. Um, So we did, we talked about bottom fishing. So you put the, this type where you got your weight down, you're floating the worm off. Cast and retrieve what he was just showing. That, That works from shore. You can put like a little spinner on, cast it out, retrieve it in. Bobber. So we didn't really have a video on a bobber, but it's almost like bottom fishing, but you put a bobber and some bait. Um... And we can talk about bait, um, worms, corn, marshmallows, power bait. Those are the big things if you're not using lures. You can use um, grubs and things like that too. So food. Fish are going to be where there's food, right? Their job is to eat, and so they're looking for food. So uh, sometimes if you have like a little creek flowing in, usually there's some stuff there floating around. Um but a lot of times we don't have access to the whole lake, so we're going to be stuck with where we're at anyway. But if you are somewhere where you can get around, these are things to look for. Structure. So what do we mean by structure? Anytime you just have like a flat mud bottom, that fish has nowhere to hide in there, right? So when we start talking about structure, we got rocks. So it can hide in between rocks, uh, trees, 
um, maybe some drop-offs here. You can see fish like to like to hide on these shelves of drops. Um, anytime you've got plants, weeds, but then you're dealing with tangling in the weeds. So structure, look for some structure that you can fish. It's always a good idea. Again, that is if you have access to those areas. Questions or comments there, you guys. Um, a lot of times we don't we don't have a lot of choice in this, but if you if you have an open area you can go to, these are some things to look for. Um, okay, we've talked a little bit about this throughout the throughout the night, and uh, we can touch on this more next week too. But fishing, patience is big, right? Um, if you go out and you think it's going to all happen in the first 10 minutes, you're setting yourself up for failure. It sometimes it can be that quick. Sometimes it can, but a lot of times it's not. Um, and stealth, right? We're out there and just imagine somebody walks in your house and they're really noisy. You don't want to be there, right? If somebody's quiet and it's being chill, they're okay. They can stay. That's you. You're going out into the fish's home. So you want to be stealthy about it. If you're making a bunch of noise or throwing rocks in the lake, things like that. Okay, so recognizing a bite. Um, so on a bobber, we're just looking for that bobber to, to, to dip or even sink all the way. Pretty, pretty easy visual indicator. Um, oh, I got a good tangle there, hang on. When we're bottom fishing, so you cast out, let the, let the weight sink, and then reel in to where you're, you can feel the bottom as you're coming in, so you're nice and tight, okay? And then what's gonna happen here is that fish is gonna pick up that bait and it's going to go like, and start pulling. And you just see the tip move, okay? And I usually wait till about the third time it does that before I set that hook. Now, what you may also get is the, I've got a fish, pick it up and reel it in, right? Okay, sometimes they just take it and they are on. So at that point, just give it a nice little set and reel it in. But more often than not, what we're seeing is just a little Okay, and so about that third one, and that can be over a matter of a couple minutes. It's, it doesn't always happen that quickly. I mean, it can be, and so you wait. You walk up to your pole and you wait. And then you might see it again, but you wait. When you see that fish doing that is when you set the hook. Okay. Now, sometimes they're finicky, and you've got to kind of just time it. So sometimes what I'll do is if I see that, I'll pick the pole up, and when I feel them, I set the hook. Try to do this without killing myself. So, so fish is biting. Dink, dink, dink. Set the hook. Okay. So when I'm out fishing on the shore, I have these little things, and they just go into the ground. So you kind of got to bear with me here. They just go in the ground. I'll try to put them here. And then I put my rod in this like that. Okay. And then I'm just waiting. And they even make little bells that you can stick up there. I use those a lot. And so I put a little bell up there and I'm just listening for that ding ding. And when I hear that first one, we run to the pole. And a lot of times I'll just gently pick it up. And if there's any slack, I'll just pick up the slack. And then I'm waiting for the dink dink, set the hook. But usually I just throw rocks and steer a little before we get So we, we talked a little bit about this first. Um, earlier, once you have, once you have the fish on, okay. If you're just doing this, you hear that clicking noise, you're reeling through drag. So you're just spinning your line. That fish is pulling hard enough that you can't make any ground on them. Sometimes you've got to tighten this, but if you tighten it too much, you can snap your line. Okay. So that's when you kind of wait, and you might pull gently and reel down and pull gently and reel down. But every time you let, you, you let down, you want to be reeling because if you give slack, the fish can get off. Most times it's better just to keep your pole up about 45. Let the bend in the pole do the work as you reel steadily and slowly. Depending on the size of the fish, some are going to pull harder than others. A lot of the times it's just a nice steady reel will do the job. Probably 75% of your fish, that's the way to do it. Every now and then you get bigger something that takes a run on you and you gotta let them you gotta let them pull drag. 
Um, so most of the time when I'm fishing, I'm fishing to catch and keep. But I do want to talk just a little bit about catch and release. If we're planning on releasing the fish, you want to try your best to keep them in the water. In fact, with salmon and stuff, it's the law. You have to keep it in the water while you take the hooks out. So easier said than done. But if you're going to release that fish, try to keep them in the water. If you have a net or something, kind of use the net as like a holding area so you can get the fish. Um, if you can do it without touching the fish, great. A lot of times you can reach out with a pair of pliers, grab the hook, and then let the fish go, and you don't have to touch the fish. Um, a lot of times they're flopping around too much to do that. So just do your best if you're going to release the fish to let them go. Sometimes we have to catch and release. Um, not so much here in Spokane County. Uh, I would say Spokane River is that way. But just, again, know your rules. So there's certain fish you can keep and certain ones you can't. Um, I don't have a picture of one right now. When we're talking, I assume we fish Lake Roosevelt. So when you're out there, the trout, now you have to release if they don't have an adipose fin. So do you know what I'm talking about there? Okay, so that's the fin on the top side just before the tail. This is maybe six inches from the tail or four inches from the tail. They clip that off at the hatchery. And that's how they know it's a hatchery fish and not a native or natural fish. And so they want to keep those natural fish in the lake, so they encourage you to release those by, they said you can't keep them anymore. So, so that's what we call a marked fish. Some, sometimes you have a selective fishery where you can only keep ones that are clipped, and sometimes you can keep ones that aren't clipped, and sometimes it's so many clipped and unclipped. It gets very convoluted, but most of the time that's how we know is that fin is clipped. So. Sometimes you don't know until you've netted the fish what you have. And then you look and you go, okay, this one's got to go back, so I'm going to leave it in the water, unhook it, and then gently release it into the water to swim away. If you have gloves, like rubber gloves, it's always good to hold the fish that way too because then you're not getting your finger scents and stuff on the fish because that damages them. Okay, questions for tonight. Um, next week we'll talk a little bit more about some ba boat tactics. Um, tonight was kind of a intro and... Um, Shore fishing. So, what's your question? So you said at stealth, uh, related. If someone quiet walks into your house, a complete stranger walks into your house. If they're not loud, you're just gonna let them stay. I'm gonna step the You're just gonna let them stay there. You're not gonna be like, oh hey, what's up, random dude? I'm calling the police. You're just gonna let them stay if they're quiet. That we're we're like we are like. It's trying to sneak into somebody's house and steal the fish. Uh, if you're going to fish, catch and release, and that's what you're going to do, try to use barbless hooks. Thank you. Good point. Good point. Barbless hooks. Well, and sometimes that's required, depending on where you are. Or crimp the hooks so the barbless yeah. not there. Dad, yep. what, do you, what do you do when it's like you're not supposed to catch that fish, but you can't get the hook on them? Cut the line. Out? You cut the line. What if I don't have scissors? scissors and I'm weak and I can't do it and the fish suffocates no. before but, I get back out but there. But ser seriously, if, if you can't get the hook out or it's going to damage, just cut the line and, and that's the best way to go there. That hook will eventually work itself out of that fish. Has anybody ever caught a fish with somebody else's line in it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Didn't we catch a real one? I've had yeah. one with eight or nine in it. <laughs> Big one? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Seventy-six pounds. Yeah. Okay. Dad, didn't we catch a real That must have been in the ocean. Sturgeon. River. I think that was the first one to set the hook. Huh. Combat fishing. Okay. Okay. I caught a fish uh, last year that had little fishies in its mouth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the you asked about color. Mm -hmm. If you see what color that fish is, use that kind of lure because that's oh. what he's eating. And that's why when you see things like. Uh, they look like little fish, right? Because mm -hmm. that's what they're feeding on. Gotcha. And so they try to mimic those kinds of fishes. So, uh, if you guys you keep those hooks, bring them back next week if you want, or um, go home and practice. Um, if you bring them back, I could. What we'll do next week is we'll make some. We'll throw some beads on and make something with it. Okay. Big 
Any other questions for tonight? Um, it's a lot to go over. I didn't. I didn't.